Welcome everyone to Voice of the Product, an interview series where we talk with leaders of organizations who are embracing the product-led movement. Today we have Connor O'Mahony, Chief Product Officer at Clavio. Connor has a rich tradition of uh, leading cultural transformations and uh, digital transformations among organizations. So thank you for being here. It's my pleasure. And congratulations on your Series B. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, Clavio's product and, and the stage of company that they're at right now? Sure. Um, so Clavio is all about growth. We are growing like crazy. Um, and primarily because we focus on helping our customers grow. Mm. Um, Clavio essentially uh, marries a, a, a deep analytics engine together with marketing uh, technology uh, to help our customers provide the right message uh, to the right people at the right time in order to help them grow. And so you have been with the company now for about two years. Is that correct? A year and a couple and seven months or so? That's right. Okay. I started off as an advisor. Mm -hmm. um, and then after about a year as an advisor, I came on as the chief product officer. And at the time, you were advising the CEO and the, the chief product officer as well? And the head of product. And the head yeah. of product. Yeah. And so tell me a little bit about what that advising work was looking like or, or what kind of problems they were working throughout that time. Yeah, in, in my experience, um, a lot of companies experience the same kinds of challenges. Um, how to figure out what to build, mm. uh, when to build it, uh, how to make decisions, um, how to uh, distribute decision making down through the organization, um, and, and how to have that decision making be as data informed as possible. And so you say data informed, but not data driven. By being data informed, you can figure out the right degree to which you want to invest in a particular part of the product or not. Um, there's a big difference between um, building out a, a you know a fully fledged feature and a feature that's good enough to meet the market to meet the needs of the market. Mm. And and. Is data the only thing that kind of tells you whether or not to build out maybe an MVP or, or good enough versus a big product? Or are there other sort of indicators of which, which way to go? Well, um, user testing mm. is a form of data. Uh, there are a set of data points there. Um, feedback from an MVP are a set of really good data points. Uh, so those all go into the mix. Mm -hmm. It's not just user research ahead of time. It's not just market penetration for like products. Um, it's not just um, usage levels of uh, certain capabilities. It's not just incoming feature requests from customers. It's the marriage of all of that together. Mm. And so it sounds like there's both um, uh, both qualitative and quantitative data sort of married together to make these decisions. There is qualitative and quantitative uh, data. Um, a lot of the qualitative data can be uh, positioned uh, in a more quantitative manner if you have uh, enough data points. I've got a story from a previous job uh, that I worked at where uh, early on in the job, I came on board and I started digging through the data. And what I did was I basically measured how everybody had spent the last six months of their time. And then what I did was I went and I turned that into a view of the different projects and where everybody had spent their time. I worked with finance to translate their time into a dollar amount. And then I got up in front of the company and I said, hey, you know what? For the last six months, the company has spent $400,000 in this particular feature, $20,000 in this other feature, and so on. And, and it was real interesting because the people who had worked on those features had a, an immediate visceral reaction. They thought to themselves, oh, $400,000 on this feature that had no impact on the business? $20,000 in this feature that had a big impact on the business? And I got an immediate reaction. The immediate reaction was that um, people then volunteered saying, you know, we need to do this on an ongoing basis. And what it did was it actually started to shift the culture of the company where they had a much greater appreciation for the fact that their time was an investment from the company 
and that in turn, in turn, we needed to not only measure that investment, but we needed to measure the return on that investment. And over time, the company became very focused on ensuring that we use the right data to inform the right kinds of decisions. Are we drowning in data right now as folks who are worried about growth in product? I don't believe we are. Um, sometimes it feels like it, um, but in, in, in my estimation, we're actually not gathering enough data. Mm. Um, the reason I say sometimes it feels like it is because a, a lot of the data we're gathering is fragmented. Uh, it's fragmented and it's not easily combined with other mm. uh, sources of data. And because of that, it can feel very unwieldy. Um, first of all, just to gather um, in, in you know, one place so it, it can be worked with. Uh, and so it causes a lot of pain. Um, and because of that pain, it, it, it feels like we're drowning in data. You know, if we're, if we're to look at the inevitable that's coming, the inevitable that's coming is that we're going to continue to leverage data more and more in our decision making. And if we're to do that effectively, we do need more data. I, I think it's inevitable that there's more data coming our way, but we just need to find better ways to handle it. Mm. And what are your biggest recommendations for folks that are handling a lot of data or feeling like they're drowning in data themselves um, to either clear it up or, or to somehow gain some sanity around, around all the data? Yeah, so right now, um, Clavio is investing a significant amount in people to go and clean that data, mm. integrate that data, um, be able to analyze that data. Uh, we have ops resources, BI resources, engineering resources that are all being put to play around us right now. Um, we're, doing, we're, we're making that significant investment because we believe um, in data-informed decision-making, and we believe that it's necessary for us to do that in order to grow effectively. Mm. And, and it's a people process right now. Do you think in the future it will be, we'll have better tools or better software, or, or where do you see this sort of uh, uh, world of data in, in the next 10 years or so? It has to uh, evolve beyond um, a people resource intensive process. Mm. Um, if you look at a lot of the announcements in the world of data and business intelligence. There are a lot of exciting things that are happening right now. A lot of uh, interesting acquisitions, a lot of interesting product developments. That's only going to accelerate as we move forward. It sounds like product-led growth is not necessarily automating every human touch point. Um, and if that's the case, what is? how do you think about growth with product-led growth? Yeah. So. Here's literally the way I think about it um, as I, you know, work at the sea level. I look at, in Clavio's case, um, us growing the team in line with the growth of the business um, for the next several years. So if the business revenue is growing at this rate, I expect the team to be growing at a very similar rate. But then I do expect an inflection point where the business will keep on growing at the same rate, but the team size will grow at a, at a lower rate. Mm. So I always expect the team to be uh, growing as we're um, going forward at Clavio, but just not at the same rate as the revenues of the business. So Connor, you have worked at both companies uh, before Clavio that were non-product led and now at product led companies. What are the differences that you've seen between uh, the different kind of uh, sets of companies? At companies that are not product-led, uh, what you can often have happen is um, large customer opportunities end up driving um, the roadmap mm. and the product strategy. And then what ends up happening oftentimes is you end up with a, um, a product that's not very cohesive. Um, it's meeting specific needs uh, from different customers that are not necessarily aligned. So what you end up is you end up with a bit of a Frankenstein of a product. Uh, it does a pretty good job, but in my experience, what ends up happening then is you also end up accumulating a bunch of uh, product debt along the way because uh, oftentimes you end up with multiple underlying platforms 
uh, that are each designed to meet different specific needs of particular customers. Um, so what I, what I often find ultimately, uh, the big uh, difference is that non-product-led companies end up having a ceiling, a point above which they struggle to grow. They end up plateauing in a way uh, that growth-driven product companies don't. Mm. And it almost seems like if if a company is building a product just for a particular enterprise company, and let's say that that company leaves the product itself, what has happened and have you seen that happen? And kind of how does that change the product if you've built a product for a company and then they leave and are no longer a customer? Yeah, um, I, I've had direct experience with that um, where it can cause a lot of turbulence because what'll sometimes happen is you'll build a particular feature for a specific customer and let's imagine they're paying you many, many millions of dollars for that. But you'll also start accumulating some smaller customers who can take advantage of those same features. Mm. The problem is then if the big customer pulls out, uh, you're left supporting a bunch of smaller customers uh, in perhaps a non-sustainable business model. And to go back when you were talking about um, product-led growth companies not having the ceiling that non-product-led growth companies can have, can you talk a little bit about what that ceiling looks like and why product-led companies are unique to not have that ceiling? Yeah, so um, I actually experienced this in a couple of companies where we literally hit a revenue plateau above which we really struggled uh, to move. And now when that happened, we realized that we had a couple of options. One was to reformulate the product and make, make some really hard decisions about the customers that we wanted to keep and not. Or two was to look at alternative ways to grow. Um, and in those cases, we looked at the alternative ways to grow, which included growth through acquisition, um, which is a very different dynamic um, and has a, a, a big impact uh, on the business on a few dimensions, including how the company is valued. So, Connor, word on the street is that you lead the product team that also is the design, design and product together, customer success, customer support, and a few other uh, ancillary teams. How do you go about creating team alignment throughout all of them um, in terms of both projects that they're working on, but also metrics that they're looking at? Yeah, so it's interesting. As a um, product-led company, um, we want the product to be as informed by our customer touch points as we can. So that was part of the rationale for having me um, also uh, lead the customer success and the customer support and the academy teams. Mm. Those are really important customer touch points. We want to make sure that there's as little friction as possible in getting information from our customers back into our product and design teams. Oh, interesting. Um, so there are a lot of synergies there. Um, it's interesting, I've talked to one or two other product leaders um, in North America, and this um, is something that uh, other companies are also doing. Um, I think it's too early to call it a trend, but I think it could emerge as a trend. Mm. One of uh, my personal biggest frustrations has been around what are called voice of the customer programs. This is where uh, a company will typically try to gather from their customer touch points uh, information to be used by the product team. Uh, a lot of those programs I've found have been very superficial. Um, yeah, they've maybe tagged some information in support tickets and in customer contacts, and they've done some reporting on that. And, you know, perhaps there's been some level of analysis and, and, and writing around it. But um, what I believe is needed is you need some glue to tie it all together. So one of the things we're doing at Clavio is uh, we're creating these people uh, in our customer support organization who are what we are calling sages for the product or for a particular part of the product. And now their job is first of all to compile all of the customer feedback for that area they're a sage for. Then what they're tasked with doing is getting together with their product manager for that area. 
When the two of them are meeting regularly, it's a, it's a two-way exchange. Uh, the sage is representing the voice of the customer for that particular area. The product manager is informing the sage on what's coming next. And, and there's just so many uh, benefits beyond that because that sage is then going back and spending time with the rest of the folks on the customer support team, educating them better on what's coming in that part of the product. and and. The Sage is also gathering more input from them to in turn uh, return to the product manager. Um, it's little programs like this. It's programs where you have people that are acting as the glue here that are representing different parts of the product. That's the secret to making these programs effective and actually enacting change in the product. So one of the hallmarks of a product-led company um, is an easy way to get into the product and to get your hands on the product. So a free trial or a freemium experience. Uh, what has Clavio done to sort of uh, create that easy experience that, that folks can kind of get their hands uh, dirty with the product immediately? Yeah, we do have a freemium product that we, have, um, that we offer, but far more interesting is an internal initiative we have. Um, it's all about reducing friction. Um, what, we're try what we're trying to do internally is we're trying to have it so that our customers can be fully up and running in our product within 60 minutes. And uh, we call this Clavio N60. It's an internal uh, initiative where we're looking at every step along the way. Does that user experience, is that uh, holistic of the marketing experience into the product and the product itself, or, or is this more, more of a product team initiative? It has to be um, holistic. Mm. We need to look at our touch points from marketing, through sales, through the product, through the ongoing account management, and make sure they're all consistent. We also need to make sure that at each of those touch points, um, we're having a set uh, we're providing a set of user experiences that are cohesive and then consistent we're setting the right expectations and then we're either delivering on those expectations or exceeding mm. and and with a complex product like clavio how has it been to reduce friction so far has it been uh easier than you've expected or or more difficult it's a real challenge it's a real challenge but you know, it's a real challenge that the people who work at Clavio embrace. It's, uh, it's a part of the reason some of them have come to join Clavio is because we want to solve this challenge. Connor, is there something happening in the market or uh, in the world in general that you personally are very excited to dive into deeper or learn, learn more about? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm really excited about the potential for machine learning. Uh, it's an area that at Clavio are making big investments in. Um, there is a lot of hype around machine learning, but there's also a lot of very real value that is being delivered. Um, in some cases, it's obvious that it's being delivered, but in more cases, it's not. And that's a lot of the key around how to seamlessly integrate it into a product is to have it you know, be integrated in such a way as people are not even aware. Uh, that you're doing smart things for them under the cover based upon uh, the results of some machine learning. And and so I think that speaks to what you were talking about, about reducing friction, right? So it shouldn't even be a thought in your mind that machine learning is the reason that this personalized experience is happening. It's just, it's it's almost magical. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and when you have that seamless experience, um, it, it's just so smooth and, and, you know, it tends to delight but people don't put their finger on the fact that it's actually delighting them, but they have those positive associations with the brand. And then in turn, it leads to word of mouth uh, references, which are the most uh, desirable references you can have. Absolutely. Well, Connor, thank you so much for being here today and sharing your valuable time with us. Thank you for having me. And thank you so much for spending your time with us today as well. Don't forget to check out other articles and videos on the Product-Led Growth Collective and have a wonderful rest of your day.